Here again for just a moment, a verse from Philippians 4, verse 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. And from the Gospel according to Luke, a few verses from the third chapter again, and the crowds asked him, what then should we do? In reply, he said to them, whoever has two coats must share with anyone who has none, and whoever has food must do likewise. Even tax collectors came to be baptized, and they asked him, Teacher, what should we do? He said to them, Collect no more than the amount prescribed for you. Soldiers also asked him, And we, what should we do? He said to them, Do not exhort money from anyone by threats of false accusation, and be satisfied with your wages. Dancing with joy. Some years ago, I heard the story from a colleague about a young woman named Christine who wanted to be a dancer. More than anything in life, Christine wanted to dance. And she clearly knew the source of her inspiration. She was inspired by having seen a performance by a very famous dancer named Rose. Christine was mesmerized by Rose, watching the movements of her feet and hands, and the way Rose moved with her partner and the smile on her face that lit up the entire hall. She remembered the way Rose seemed completely absorbed by the music and the movement, so completely in the moment with her entire body and mind and spirit. Her eyes were alive. Her face was bright, radiating with energy. Her arms and hands were constantly in motion. Her feet were amazing, spinning, jumping, twisting, twirling. The dance brought Rose to life, and it brought people watching her to life. It wasn't the fame or the lights or the applause and adulation or the stage that drew Christine's admiration to Rose. No, it was one simple thing, joy. What Christine saw in Rose was joy. The, they, the joy found expression in every fiber of Rose's body. Rose danced to the joy she found in the rhythm of the music. Joy was in the way the music's rhythm matched her every movement. It was in the muscles in her body. It was in the way the audience was mesmerized with her, hanging on every turn to see what would come next. What Christine saw in Rose was unbounded joy, and she wanted that joy. And then one day she learned that Rose's tour company was coming to the town where she lived and she'd have a chance to see Rose again. And she was determined this time to meet her, to get up close and find out what was Rose's inspiration. When the performance was over and others made their way to the exits, Christine found her way to the stage and to her surprise found herself almost alone with Rose. And the words came tumbling out of her mouth. How did you learn to dance like that? How did you actually learn? And how did you become a dancer? After years of waiting to ask, Christine hung on every word of Rose's answer. Well, I had quite a few lessons, and I studied under some great accomplished teachers from across the country. 
and all of that was a big help in the beginning. I learned all of the techniques. But do you know the truth of my dancing? Do you really want to know the truth of my dancing? More than anything, said Christine, Rose said to her, the truth is I started to dance the way I do now after I had been through some hard times. With many days and nights of despair, it was like living in a tunnel that seemed to grow smaller and smaller every day. My life was overtaken by an addiction, and I was completely out of control. And there was a day when I had to decide if I wanted to live. I had gotten all the way to rock bottom. I was all the way down. And that day I said to myself, Rose, if you're going to live, you got to dance. You got to move. You got to do something that takes everything you have to give. And I said to myself, and I say that to myself every day, I've got to dance. What people see now is how much I love dancing, and I do. But if I hadn't hit rock bottom, if I hadn't known despair, if it hadn't been for the tragedy and pain and difficulty and struggle in my life, I would have never known the love and joy of dancing and of living. My dance and my joy comes out of my pain. My joy is found in my dancing. And I just have to dance it out. And so I thought I'd come this morning and uh, just say a word on this third Sunday of Advent. Just a word about dancing and joy. Dancing with joy. Joy and rejoicing, you know, is the theme of this third Sunday of Advent. The joy that is at the heart of the good news of Jesus the Christ. Gaudete, the Latin word for joy. And an interesting part of the old Latin tradition is that on this Gaudete Sunday, there's a rose or a pink candle in the Advent wreath. The other candles are purple the color, color of penitence. But today, Joy Sunday, we light a pink candle, and it's not pink because Mary really wanted a baby girl, as some have suggested. But the candle is pink because this Sunday and day is the day of joy. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We can even make a good case that the Christian faith and the Jewish Torah and the Christian Bible are basically about joy. The psalmist in the 97th Psalm proclaims, The Lord is sovereign. Let the whole earth rejoice. Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation, says Psalm 95. The prophet Isaiah said, With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. Shout aloud and sing for joy. And the prophet Zephaniah proclaims, Sing aloud, O daughters of Zion. Shout, O Israel, rejoice. And do it with all your heart. You know, when I get loud sometimes, and I just, got, I just can't help myself sometimes, it, it's really all about joy. <laughs> joy. Apparently there's something going on here that's more important uh, than all of the evil, than all of the injustice, than all of the darkness and despair in the world. There's something more profound and more real than all of the dismal gloom prophet sees in the world apparently there's a light shining in the darkness and speaking of darkness and despair Paul the Apostle was in jail in a dark dismal dank cell somewhere in the Roman Empire we're not sure where he was exactly but we know that he was on his way to Rome to his trial and probable execution 
And what does he say to his friends in that little church in Philippi who themselves were facing persecution and torture and possible death? This is what he says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Tough times, rejoice. Terror in the land, rejoice. Temptations and trials on every hand, rejoice. Trouble, rejoice. Trials and temptations, rejoice. Count it all joy, rejoice. And this is not superficial, Pollyannish, or phony cheerfulness. There's something that wells up in the depths of a person's soul. Something grounded in a reality more real and more powerful than any jail cell, than any prison or physical torture, more real than death itself. Rejoice. And again I say to you, rejoice. True joy doesn't just gestitate in solitude. It keeps company with those things in life that are the hardest to talk about and in many ways the experiences that seem furthest from joy. Joy comes right alongside pain and hurt and disappointment. Often when you hear someone tell about a place of real joy in their life, a part of that same story is also about hardship, or maybe it's about struggle and challenge, or maybe it's about waiting and watching with faith and dancing with joy. Joy is an inside job. That's what Margie said this morning. It's an inside job. It comes from a place deep within. Sometimes we have to go through something in order to get to something. huh? It's about more than happiness. Happiness is based upon your happenings. And if your happenings are not happening the way you want them to happen, then it destroys your happiness. But joy is an inside job. And it shows up regardless of what's going on in the life. It's really what that weirdo in the wilderness, John the Baptist, is talking about here in the Gospel of Luke. There doesn't seem to be much joy in what he's saying there in that reading, in that third chapter of Luke. There seems to be a lot of fire and brimstone and judgment. But when we take a good long look at old John, you discover that his message is also one of joy. John is really saying to us here that joy is found in repentance. It, it, it is for those who repent and bear the fruit befitting repentance. And what is repentance? Repentance is turning around. It's an about face. It is meaningful and immediate action. Of all of the people that appear in the nativity and early infancy stories of Jesus, Mary, Joseph, Zechariah, Elizabeth, S Simeon, Anna, no one in the gospel but this way out weirdo in the wilderness crank of a preacher named John the Baptist gives us such a clear image of the meaningful and immediate action we must take in order to prepare for the arrival of the promised one. And here it is, meaningful and, and, and immediate action, fruit befitting repentance. The multitudes asked him, and what shall we do? And he answered them, he who has two coats, let him share with one who has none. He who has food, let him do likewise. Tax collectors also, what shall we do? And he said to them, collect no more than is appointed you. Soldiers, what shall we do? And he said, rob no one by violence or by false accusation and be content with your wages. The way to prepare for the Messiah and the joy of the Lord is to get your house in order, reestablish good old-fashioned ethical standards, reaffirm kindness, value compassion, practice honesty, live up to your calling, just do the right thing. You know the headlines I referred to last week in the New York Daily News from a few weeks ago after the shootings out in Southern California, uh, you know, and, and the headline said, God isn't fixing this, you know, and what they're saying, that really all of this talk, oh, I'm praying, I'm talking, I'm praying for you, I'm pulling, for talk is cheap. We don't need folks who just to say the right things, we need somebody just to do the right thing. Just, not, don't, don't, don't just talk the talk, walk the walk. So when we withhold compassion and kindness 
from others, the kind that would deny the extra coat we own from one who has none, or spare food that we have from someone who is hungry, we are callous and hardened to life and to the suffering of others. And to that extent, we are distanced from God. This is judgment, and it weighs against us. And the judgment is that we separate ourselves from God, building deep, wide chasms that become harder and harder to transverse. Into the midst of our sophisticated, intellectual, urbane, urbane world, with complicated moralities and ethics, John the Baptist, the weirdo in the wilderness, comes along proclaiming the simple, clear, practical, uncomplicated terms of a kingdom that is brought about by simple acts of kindness and compassion, justice and right-mindedness. How does the kingdom come? How does the joy of the Lord come? Not in great prophetic or even distinctly religious acts, so much as in the simpler business of bearing fruit that benefits repentance. Do the obvious. Let your word be good. Speak the truth. Love others. Love, period. Forgive others. Hug your children. Be gentle as you go about life. Deal fairly in business. Seek the welfare of others. Be kind to strangers. Give away a spare coat. Volunteer in the community Saturday lunch program. Give in the mission offering. Make a pledge to support the mission and ministry of the church. Tax collectors, collect no more than is appointed you to collect. Soldiers, police, don't rob people with violence. Don't, don't you be so uptight. Move out of your comfort zone. Don't be so self-contained. In other words, go ahead right where you are and learn to dance. Yes, weeping endures for night, but joy comes not just in the morning, but joy comes in your dance. I say joy comes not just in the morning, but joy comes in your dance. I, I close with this. I love this story that Jim Wallace tells in his books, God's Politics, about South Africa. Went to all outward appearances. Parthite still had a stranglehold on power. Nelson Mandela was still in jail. Wallace was at an ecumenical service at the Cathedral of St. George's in Cape Town. Archbishop Desmond Tutu was presiding when a group of the notorious South African security police broke into the service. Wallace writes, Tutu stopped preaching, just looked at the intruders who walked down the aisles and around the edges of the congregation with their writing pads and their tape recorders. They'd already arrested Tutu and other church leaders just a few weeks before this, and they kept them in jail for several days. After meeting their eyes with his steely gaze, Bishop Tutu acknowledged their power, but reminded them that he served a higher power than their political authority. And then, in a most extraordinary challenge to political tyranny, Bishop Tutu told the representatives of South African apartheid, the security uh, police structure of South Africa, he said to them, you know, you've already lost. And so I invite you today to come over to the winning side. I know not when, I know not how, but I know that in the end, love and justice and truth will win. So why don't y'all come on over to the winning side? And he said it with a smile on his face and with joy in his heart and with an enticing warmth in his invitation, but with a clarity and a boldness that took everyone's breath away. The congregation's response was electric. The crowd was literally transformed by the bishop's challenge to power. And from fear before the heavily armed security forces that surrounded the cathedral and greatly outnumbered the band of worshipers, the congregation literally leaped to their feet, shouted praises to God and began to dance.
They started dancing in the aisles. Wallace said they danced all around the cathedral. They danced all out into the streets and around the police and military force. And they not knowing what to do, they just backed up and got out of the way as the people of God danced around the cathedral and in the streets. Ten years later, Wallace attended the inauguration of Nelson Mandela as president and he spoke to Bishop Tutu and asked him if he remembered that day earlier when they had danced in the cathedral and out in the streets and Tutu said he did remember. Wallace reflected, you know, apartheid did not die the day Mandela was released from prison or the day he was inaugurated as president of South Africa. It died the day they danced for freedom in the streets of South Africa. Uh, you know, you don't have to wait until the battle is over to shout. You can shout now. You don't have to wait until the struggle is over to get your dance on. You can get it on now. And maybe, my friends, it's time, it's time, it's time for us to do some dancing. To dance in the aisles and dance out onto the streets of the city of New York and let the whole world know that this joy that I had, the world didn't give it to me and the world can't take it away. Just go ahead and dance. Don't overthink it too much, just dance. Don't think about it too much, just dance. We can literally dance our way out of darkness. Dance our way even in darkness. And so if you had a hard way to go, just dance. You got a mean problem? Maybe just get your dance on. If you got a cross, bear it. Yeah, if you got a prejudice, overcome it. If you got an evil, destroy it. If you got a challenge, face it. If they talk about you, keep on praying for them. If they step on you, bounce back. If they put you up against the ropes, come back swinging. And if they kill you, live on anyhow with your dance on. When I think about the goodness of the Lord and what God has done for me and for us, it makes me want to dance. Dance, dance, dance. <laughs> oh, I'm not going to wait until the morning comes to get my dance on. I'm going to dance now. <laughs> Praise the name of our God. Praise the name of our God. We serve a mighty God. We serve a mighty God. Yes, we do. Glory to God.